Hello, my name is Lynn Weldon. This is where I grew up in the 1960s. That's when I developed an interest in unidentified flying objects, UFOs. In my room, I read anything I could get my hands on. I collected newspaper articles, read books, special magazines, including Look Magazine's cover story about a New Hampshire couple, Betty and Barney Hill. Their story resonated with me because we lived in New Hampshire at the same time and had driven the same road where their nightmare experience took place. In 1967, I have my own UFO experience right here. A friend and I are camping out. We're sitting around a fire. It's after dark. And at one point, I look up into the branches of this hickory tree and I see a solid white orb about five inches in diameter floating through the branches. My friend sees the same thing. A couple months later, I write a paper about it for my English class. In 1968, I interviewed Harold Merritt, my great uncle and a World War I pilot about a cone-shaped UFO he saw in the skies here in the 1930s. In 1970, I learned hypnosis. My friend Denny is my first subject in this very room. That's when I learned how easily the brain can be manipulated, how vulnerable it is to outside influences. People who subscribe to Darwin's theory of evolution, taught in all government schools, tend to believe that UFOs and their occupants are an advanced form of humans with a million year jump on us. Others take it a step further and say, they're here to help us when the time is right. I used to believe that, but then I read Chuck Missler's groundbreaking book, Alien Encounters. Chuck says we're dealing with a trickster that's downright dangerous. He can manipulate our minds. He can plant thoughts. He can erase memories. He communicates by means of mental telepathy. In the hands of the trickster, we're nothing but putty. We cannot understand this dark force because he resides outside the dimensions that we're used to. However, he is not invincible. Once in a while, he leaves enough clues exposing who he really is. To illustrate what I'm talking about, consider the strangest day in UFO history, April 24th. 1964. This is Irene and Warren Feaster and their farmhouse near Estella, Pennsylvania. On that Friday morning in April, while it's still dark, Irene looks out her kitchen window. She sees a flash of light in the hayfield behind the barn. Warren goes out to investigate. He discovers an eight-foot circle burned into the ground. The outer edge is about eight inches wide. Warren's son Gary was 23 years old at the time. He saw the crop circle too. It wasn't egg-shaped or anything. It was perfectly round. A little bit lighter on the outside. Gary's but, wife uh, Linda says people were struggling to come up with an answer. One of our neighbors came and he was looking at it and he said, oh yeah, he saw, they thought, they had a study of something about some kind of fertilizer spots. They thought maybe it was that, you know. She says there were other small circles nearby. More circles showed up later. The Tawanda paper stopped the press and added the story to the front page above the fold. It said the grass inside the circle was much greener than the grass outside. Rich Higley was 10 years old at the time. His parents owned a farm just down the road. Of course, knew the feasters. Uh, Warren was our rural mail, mail deliverer. Uh, I just remember probably being scared. It wasn't man-made, I'll tell you that right now. It wasn't man-made. That's 99.9% sure it wasn't man-made. The same morning the crop circle is discovered, another farmer, Gary Wilcox, is spreading manure in his field in Newark Valley, New
New York. He notices a flash of light on the top of the hill and goes up to investigate. In this clearing, he walks up to a metallic craft 20 feet long and four feet high, hovering above the ground. Two alien creatures, four feet tall, with arms and legs covered by an aluminum-type bodysuit, start talking to him telepathically. During a long conversation, they ask Gary for fertilizer. The two aliens go back inside the craft, and it disappears. That afternoon, Gary returns with a 75-pound fertilizer bag and drops it on the ground. The following day, the bag is gone. A few days later, a reporter talks to Gary on the phone in this barn. How close did you get to it? A couple inches. I was touching it for about two hours. What did the surface look like it was made out of? Oh, aluminum colored, whitish colored. It had a whitish cast to it, but it wasn't bright. It was, it was shiny, but it wasn't real bright. It was just like a dish of some kind of cooking dish, really, about what it was. Now, did a door open before these people came out of it? How did they appear? How did you meet the little men? Well, I don't know. I was feeling another thing there. I was just getting ready to come back down, call the sheriff up, and see if something had fallen off an airplane. But I was kind of wondering, too, because it was off the ground. It was about four foot off the ground. and had this idling noise. And uh, I don't know. Nothing happened. I was touching it there for a couple of minutes, and I was just getting ready to go. And from underneath it someplace, I don't know, these two things or men or whatever they are came. They are about four foot high. I don't know what they are or what they, who they were, but they talked to me for about two hours up there. Hmm. You could perfectly understand them. Yeah, then. they talk better English than you're talking. Uh -huh. Did they talk with any kind of an accent? No, no accent or nothing. I spoke German and Russian when I was in the service and was nothing like either one of them. Nine hours later, on that same Friday, police officer Sergeant Lonnie Zamora is on patrol in Socorro, New Mexico. He hears an explosion and drives up this dirt road to investigate. 200 yards to his left, he spots a large, shiny, egg-shaped object resting on four legs. Two entities, four feet tall, covered in white, stand beside the craft. As he approaches the object to get a better look, it slowly rises straight up. A blue flame comes out of the bottom, making a loud sound. Then it goes silent and disappears off into the distance. Other witnesses in Socorro see the same object leaving the area. Close inspection of the scene reveals bushes with burn marks. Four rectangular holes 10 inches wide, 8 inches deep, are found in the rocky soil. Sergeant Zamora, still in shock from what he saw, is interviewed by the local radio station. Uh, now, you did say that you saw uh, two what appeared to be people dressed in white uniforms with, uh, did they have helmets on like spacemen or anything? No, sir, I would say that there are people, I just, I saw something white. White coverall, that's what I could say. It looks like they were something in white coverall. Right. But you didn't, you couldn't identify them as actually being a human being as no, you sir. and I are. No, sir, I couldn't. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, did, you, you didn't know where they turned and saw you or, or what then? Well, uh, to my, I, I would say that this, this white object turned and saw me. Yes. Were they two of them? I would say it were two because one was in front and the other was in the back. Did you have ch a, a chance to, to notice what kind of a doorway they had to this uh, this uh, object, this flying object? Didn't notice any doors, no. And uh, uh, when that took off, uh, it, it made a loud, loud roaring sound. Uh, is that uh, yes, the sir, it a very loud noise, roar sound. And then after it got up in the air about 20 feet, well, the sound seemed to disappear? The sound was uh, disappeared and was very, very quiet. You could hear a pin drop there. Let's summarize this 24th day of April, 1964. Warren Feaster, Gary Wilcox, Lonnie Zamora have nothing to gain by telling their story. In fact, 
They put their good character at risk by talking at all. Obviously, all three witness something very powerful. Bright light is associated with all three. Each craft leaves some sort of evidence on the ground. Burned grass, a red jelly-like film, burned brush, and holes in the dirt. All three pieces of evidence measure about eight inches wide or deep. Gary and Lonnie hear sounds, observe an egg-shaped craft, see two four-foot-tall entities with what look like arms and legs covered by a white cloak that hides what might have been a face able to communicate with Gary's brain for two hours. Fertilizer is involved directly or indirectly with these two cases. The grass grows faster inside the feaster circle, an effect noticed over the next two years. Gary's aliens were holding trays of dirt and asked him specifically for fertilizer. Both these craft returned. Warren's within two weeks, Gary's within 24 hours. Both these craft took off slowly and had sounds associated with the craft. My hypothesis is this. We're dealing with a single entity that can change its appearance. The craft can change, the alien can change, craft and alien being part of the same dark matter. So powerful is this dark energy, they can manipulate our brains, causing us or permitting us to see what they want us to see. It's a power almost beyond comprehension. So where do we turn for answers? Not the government, surely not scientists, not even UFO organizations. I suggest that the Bible offers the best explanation. It says that there's a cosmic battle going on between two forces, one that's good, one that's not good. The prize, human souls, your soul and my soul. Since the soul is an extension of DNA, the battle is ultimately over our DNA. He who controls DNA controls the world. The good force, God, created DNA as his crowning achievement. Man, with his 23 chromosomes, is at the top of all God's creation. DNA is the driving force behind all life, but its secrets remain with God. The evil force, Satan, wants to steal those secrets so he can hijack God's good plan for us. How does he do it? Using mind control, he steals DNA samples from men and animals. Many human abduction cases, such as Betty and Barney Hill, involve DNA being removed using needles or probes. Cattle mutilation have their DNA removed with laser-like surgical precision, leaving no blood in the animal, showing no sign of struggle. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. Chapter six is amazing because it describes how human DNA was mated with DNA altered by the evil one. The result were entities called Nephilim, which wrecked havoc in the land because they were giants. Satan has had 5,000 years since Genesis 6 to perfect his DNA experiments. Now they look just like us, as Dr. Jacobs explains in his groundbreaking book, Walking Among Us. The evil one's goal has always been the same, maximize chaos and stress on this planet, wear down our DNA, paving the way for shocking disclosure. You see, the hell-bent mad biologist Satan has one more goal, to produce the Antichrist, a charismatic world leader everyone will fall in love with. His unveiling could happen at any time, and UFOs 
will be part of that cosmic event. Satan has figured out many of DNA's mysteries, giving him and his UFO army power that boggles the mind. The Bible has a lot to say about Satan's ability to change his appearance. First, we see him as an angel that has four different faces, sometimes animal, sometimes human. Next, he's a shining light in the shape of a serpent that can communicate with humans. Then, appendages are added that look like legs and arms. Another time, he's a solid object like a wooden stick that suddenly transforms into a live, breathing snake. Those images are from the Old Testament. Jumping forward to contemporary times, Indian tribes such as the Navajo of Arizona call this trickster a skinwalker, an animal-human hybrid with supernatural power to do great harm. And of course, we've all heard about the ape-like creature called Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Why has it never been caught? Because it too is part of the trickster clan and it does not want to be caught. Is there a weapon against Satan and his army of UFOs? The name of Jesus. People of all religions, even those with no religion, have discovered the power behind Jesus' name. Evil flees when you command it to leave in the name of Jesus. Better yet, ask Jesus to take up permanent residence in your heart. Then you'll have protection around the clock, even when you sleep. When chaos happens, and it will, you'll have God's power from on high and the Holy Spirit within to deal with the stress. If you decide to follow Jesus, your DNA will thank you.